Good afternoon to all of you who are with us on the East Coast and good day to the rest of you uh, tuning in. We are glad to have you back with us. It is spring officially. Last time I was with you, we were about to cross into the new season, but it's here. A um, little gloomy here in New York today, uh, rain, uh, but you know, of course that is April territory, so no great surprise. And I also uh, am excited to let you know that we have a terrific program ahead. I wish to walk you through the agenda. So Kathy, you could go to the next slide. Let me go ahead and do that. Thank you. Um, I'll provide you with a quick uh, update on where we are with the New York State budget. Uh, Peter Wiltenberg is with us from our Buffalo office with a really interesting case with labor implications that he'll be uh, walking us all through. Uh, Kristen Thorsness is with us again uh, from Rochester, and uh, we'll be discussing this uh, issue uh, out of the NCAA and the transgender participation rule. Really interesting material that we thought all of you should know more about. Sam Dobre is around the corner from me here in New York City, um, and he'll be talking about hidden ticket, ticket fees, excuse me, uh, relating to class action complaints. And then another New York City office uh, occupant, uh, Kamisha Parkins, is back on the program. I think we're looking at record frequency. I think it's been you know three times in the last six weeks. Uh, and Kamisha is on again, this time to talk about congestion pre uh, pricing progress in New York City, a major change, uh, both from a revenue and otherwise from a basic way of living standpoint that we wanted to give you updates on. It may have uh, interesting state and national implications. With that, let me turn to the actual content for the day, and I wanted to briefly allude to where we are on the budget. We don't have one. That's the big news. Um, we are in extender land where, uh, as of April 1st, you know, we did not have um, the agreement, and so we are essentially um, living in a space where uh, the governor is providing uh, temporary patches um, that will get us to uh, the ultimate signature. It's best uh, gas at this point, but you know there's an expectation that New York State will have its budget wrapped up uh, by later this month. Um, we will see, um, but exactly when is an open question. Um, as we had prognosticated, evidently accurately, you know some programs ago, um, if the deal didn't get done well before uh, Easter, it wasn't going to get done for a little while thereafter. And lo and behold, Easter came and went. Um, so we will keep you apprised and, you know, whether the budget gets done during a week when, you know, Kristen is on or I am hosting, uh, we will make sure you get the updates right as they're available. But for now, let's turn to our first presenter, who is Peter Wiltenberg, who's a member out of our Buffalo office, who has been on the program um, a couple times before and has this really interesting case to walk us through, Bart Fiegel of Group, uh, Corporation, excuse me, which um, has implications for the labor environment. We know many of you tune in because of uh, your work with Bond in the labor space. And with that, Peter, I want to give you the floor, welcome you back, and thank you so much for educating the group. Thank you, Gabe, and good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, so yes, this is a uh, very interesting and important decision that came out last week from the Second Circuit Court of Appeals which is the federal appellate court that covers New York and a couple other states. Um, it has to do with employment discrimination under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which, as you all know, is the main federal uh, anti-discrimination in employment law. Um, and it specifically has to do with how courts should analyze so-called mixed motive cases, which are cases in which um, after there was an adverse action to the employee, it turns out that there was both a legitimate non-discriminatory reason that the employer had for taking the action, but there's also some evidence that there may have also been um, impermissible uh, discriminatory motivation um, for the action as well. Um, and at least where that discriminatory motivation was a, was a so-called motivating factor in the decision. So the basic facts of the case were that the plaintiff was a, a team leader um, managing the food service and uh, deli uh, sections of a supermarket. Um, it's undisputed that at a certain point in time, she falsified a food log, which was a serious violation of company policy. She admitted it um, and she had had several you know, similar violations of policy before. 
and her employment was terminated. It turned out that during the case, she later alleged that her manager at the store had frequently made comments that indicated a, a discriminatory bias toward women. Uh, specifically, some of the things that she testified at her deposition, he said, were that on at least three occasions that he, quote, didn't think women should be managers. Uh, she also testified that he stated that being a manager was too stressful for women and then that women were, quote, too sensitive to be managers. And one last really important fact of that case was that this manager who had made those comments was substantially involved in the decision and the process of disciplining and, you know, terminating this, this, uh, this employee's uh, employment. So she filed a lawsuit alleging uh, gender discrimination. And uh, during the case, the, um, the employer eventually made a motion for summary judgment. And I know some of you are probably familiar with that, but just basically it's when during the lawsuit, um, a party makes a motion to the judge that basically says, uh, judge, based on all the facts that are not in dispute, that we all agree on, you should end the case right now before it goes to a trial and we should win because under these, uh, facts that have been established, we should just win as a matter of law. And therefore, there's no reason to send the case to a trial because there's no facts for the jury to determine. Juries are fact finders. And if there's nothing that the jury could determine that would change this outcome, then there's no point of even sending it to a trial. So the district judge agreed with that motion and granted it. And her reasoning was that because it was undisputed that this employee had violated this serious company policy, um, she admitted it, and that um, this was the employer's stated reason for, for the termination, that this legitimate non-discriminatory reason that the employer put forward could not have been a pretext for discrimination because everybody in the case acknowledged that it actually happened, and there's no way the plaintiff could have proven that it wasn't true. So um, the district judge said, yes, Summary judgment for the employer, the case is over. On appeal though, the, um, the Second Circuit said no, um, the district judge didn't apply the correct standard. And in doing so, the Second Circuit um, sort of emphasized that it wasn't creating, that this decision that it just put out was not creating a new standard of law. It was really just trying to clarify what it has said has been the existing standard all along. And the standard that the Second Circuit reiterated should be applied in these so-called mixed motive cases is that when there are these two competing uh, explanations for uh, why the, the termination or the adverse employment action occurred, um, the question is not whether the, the one that's put forward by the um, employer can be demonstrated to be false as a pretext. That's not what the plaintiff needs to show. The plaintiff simply needs to show that there may have also been um, discrimination as a motivating factor alongside the, the reason that's given forward by the employer. And the court said that in that situation, where this is a what it calls the mixed motive case, um, that the employer can still be liable if there is a as if there is discrimination as a motivating factor, even alongside a perfectly legitimate reason for, for the termination. So the, um, the Second Circuit reversed that decision granting summary judgment by the district judge and said that basically because there's a question of fact as to whether discrimination was a motivating factor from this manager, and there is a question of fact about that because the plaintiff has testified in her deposition that he made those comments throughout her employment that indicated a discriminatory bias toward women, because there's a question of fact as to what the reason for the termination was, whether that was also a motivating factor, the case needs to go back to the trial court and most likely, unless they settle it, it'll have to go ahead to a trial. So the, the takeaway here, and it's, like I said, it's really just a, um, a reiteration of what the standard has been, um, even though there's a little bit of maybe some question about whether in this particular case, this court was actually pushing it a bit further than it had before. 
But essentially, this shouldn't really change anybody's kind of understanding of what the law had been. Um, but certainly the takeaway is that if there are um, indications of a discriminatory motivating factor for an adverse uh, action toward an employee, as the employer, you can still be liable. Um, and what should you do about that? I mean, there are a couple sort of, um, you know, best practices that you can probably try to employ to, um, to deal with this very difficult situation. Because in this particular case, too, this manager who had made the, you know, allegedly discriminatory comments um, was, you know, sort of in the, in the chain of, of events that led to the termination by essentially reporting it to HR um, and sort of recommending the termination, even though the decision was ultimately made by HR. So one of the one thing that uh, you can always try to do to avoid a situation like this is try as best you can to insulate the decision making process from any uh, from anybody who um, may have exhibited um, a uh, an inclination toward um, a discriminatory bias in the past. And obviously, there are certain situations where um, even if HR is making the decision uh, to discipline an employee, that those facts are just not going to be known at the time. Uh, but a best practice could certainly be to always interview the employee who you're considering disciplining, make sure you get their side of the story. Um, in those situations, it may come out that the employee lets you know that they um, that they allege that that an, that a manager who was involved with the process had made discriminatory remarks. And every situation is, of course, going to be different, but that would at least give you an opportunity to reconsider, consult with counsel if necessary, and maybe change course if there's another option that um, that could mitigate the risk of a discrimination claim once you learn some of those additional facts. So something that we'll keep an eye on, it's going to be interesting to see how courts apply this going forward. Peter, thank you very much. I agree, it will be interesting to see how courts apply this. And uh, if those of you tuning in have questions, uh, of course, you have uh, bond attorneys at the ready uh, to be of help. But uh, Peter, please do keep this group apprised as we learn more. Thank you so much for coming on the program. Will do, thanks turn... for having me. Oh, of course, our pleasure. Let me turn to our next uh, speaker then. And uh, that is uh, Kristen Thorsnes. Uh, Kristen is uh, of counsel uh, out of our Rochester office, has been on the program uh, previously, is a wonderful resource to the firm, and our only, to my knowledge, former Olympic athlete among our uh, attorneys. And so uh, Kristen brings a really uh, fascinating uh, background to her work um, and is here to update us on uh, transgender uh, participation rule uh, issues that have been emerging and that recently she's written on. Kristen, so glad you're with us and thank you in advance for this presentation. I look forward to listening. It's, good. it's great to be back. Um, it is estimated that of the uh, 480,000 college athletes in the United States, only about 33, that is seven one thousandths of 1% are transgender. Uh, under NCAA rules that date back to January of 2022, transgender female athletes may compete in women's events if the national governing body of the specific sport allows transgender athletes to compete. What this means that on any given campus, different teams may have different rules about um, whether or not transgender athletes uh, can compete on them. Uh, which can be very confusing. And, and if those national governing body rules change mid-season, then things get really confusing. And of course, then there's questions about scholarship uh, eligibility and all of that. Um, in addition, the NCAA requires transgender female athletes to have undergone at least one year of testosterone suppression treatments before they can compete uh, in NCAA sports. Starting in August of this year, in 2024, uh, these athletes will also be required to submit semi-annual documentation <clears throat> that their testosterone levels fall underneath their sport-specific maximums. Uh, new slide, please, Kathy. March 14th, so just a couple weeks ago, 
Um, a group of current and former college athletes filed suit in a Georgia federal court against the NCAA, against the University of Georgia system, and several University of Georgia system administrators, uh, claiming that allowing transgender females, who, which are, who are referred to as males throughout the complaint, uh, that allowing them to compete in the women's events violates the plaintiff's rights under both the 14th Amendment and Title IX. Uh, the 153-page complaint, yes, you heard that right, 153 pages, describes at length how some of the plaintiffs competed against and shared a locker room with trans female Leah Thomas at the 2022 NCAA Women's Swimming Championships at, at Georgia State. They alleged that the shared locker room caused, quote, a loss of bodily privacy and shock, humiliation, and embarrassment in violation of their constitutional right to bodily privacy, close quote. They also alleged that competing against Ms. Thomas deprived them of higher placings at the championship. Um, as a little background, um, unlike competitors in 27 of the of the other events at that meet, uh, Ms. Thomas's winning time in the 500-yard freestyle uh, did not break the collegiate record and, in fact, made her only the 15th fastest college female ever in that event. Uh, her time was about nine seconds slower than the great Katie Ledecky's 2017 record and, uh, and would not have won that event in many other years. Uh, Ms. Thomas also competed in two other events at the 2022 championships, finishing fifth in the 200 free, tied with one of the plaintiffs in the Gaines case, and eighth in the 100 free. Getting back to the complaint, um, in addition to the uh, to competing with or sharing a locker room with Leah Thomas, uh, another plaintiff complains that she and her Roanoke College teammates suffered stress and emotional anguish because of the presence of a trans female on their swimming team, even after that athlete left the team. Uh, another plaintiff claims that competing against a trans female in track caused her to lose placements and her team points. Um, the other plaintiffs don't, the other named plaintiffs don't allege that they have either competed with or against trans females, but they say that they fear that they may have to compete against males, as they call them, if the NCAA's policies do not change, and that they may have unwittingly already done so. Uh, the plaintiffs further allege a number of, of specific things. Um, they say that the NCAA has aligned itself with what they call the most radical elements of the so-called diversity, equity, and inclusion agenda uh, in order to distract attention away from the financial exploitation of college athletes by NCAA colleges and universities. Uh, they claim that the NCAA enforces a code of silence to su suppress speech by penalizing homophobic and transphobic behaviors. They argue that the NCAA rules regard, re requiring testosterone suppression uh, do not sufficiently guarantee athletic fairness and competition, and that they are in fact out of step with Olympic rules in many other sports. Um, they argue that the NCAA in fact failed to follow USA Swimming's rules at the 2022 NCAA championship. And finally, that the maximum acceptable testosterone levels that are used by several sports national, national governing bodies are just too high. They aren't fair. Um, interestingly, no national governing bodies were named in this lawsuit. Uh, new slide, please, Kathy. So what do the plaintiffs want? Well, they want a number of things. Um, first, they want the NCAA to ban transgender females from competition in women's events or in use of women's locker facilities. They want the NCAA to withdraw and redistribute awards that were previously given to trans female athletes or any teams upon which they competed. And those awards should be then uh, redistributed to, to uh, cis female competitors um, who competed against those individuals or those teams. Uh, they seek monetary damages for their emotional injuries 
They want punitive damages because they argue that the NCAA and the uh, University of Georgia system actually knew that their rules violated Title IX or the 14th Amendment. They seek recovery of attorney's fees. Um, and they also aim to convert this case to a class action. So going beyond just the named plaintiffs, and there's about a dozen of them, um, to include all of the competitors at the NCAA Women's Swimming Championships, as well as all past, current, and future female NCAA athletes. New slide, please. Um, the defendants will be filing responses to this complaint in the next few weeks, and, um, and, and we expect that they will assert a variety of potential defenses. Uh, for example, the, uh, the United States Supreme Court has previously ruled that the NCAA is not subject to Title IX, which only applies to institutional recipients of federal funds, um, not to the organizations to which they belong and pay dues. Um, and that is the U.S. versus Smith case from 1999. We also expect the NCAA to assert that as a private entity, a non-governmental entity, that it doesn't act under color of law so as to give rise to the potential for 14th Amendment liability. Uh, turning to the University of Georgia, uh, both the institution and the individual defendants, uh, they may assert that they merely hosted the 2022 NCAA Women's Swimming Championships and aren't liable for the NCAA policies that allowed Ms. Thomas to compete. Um, there's also questions about whether the five former um, athlete plaintiffs and the future athletes of the proposed class have standing to sue under Title IX because there are cases that say that that former and and potential athletes uh, don't have Title IX standing. And uh, and then finally, um, there may be some statute of limitations problems um, under Title IX. Uh, statutes of limitations are based on state law, uh, which tend to range from one to six years, and so uh, this may limit the class of the past athlete members to those who fall within their own uh, state statutes of limitations. Okay, more slide. Um, I wanted to just add that at the same time, um, a, a kind of a similar case is pending here in the, in the Second Circuit uh, regarding trans female athletes that are competing in high school sports. Um, the case is called Sewell versus Connecticut Association of Schools. Um, in that case, um, some a group of plaintiffs asserted that allowing trans females to compete in girls' events violated Title IX uh, deprive them of pu public recognition, the chance to be champions, and possible college recru recruiting and even future employment. <clears throat> uh, th the district court, the trial court, ruled that these alleged losses were too speculative and, and that there was no evidence that the defendants should have known that this policy of allowing transgendered students to, to compete that that violated Title IX because of Department of Education and Supreme Court rulings that that court found strongly support a conclusion that the policy did not violate Title IX. Um, panel of the Second Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed that ruling initially, but the Second Circuit then took the unusual move of voting to reconsider that decision on bonk, which is all of the justices on the court get together instead of just the, the few that sat on the initial appellate panel. <clears throat> um, with eight justices dissent, dissenting in whole or in part, and six justices filing separate concurring opinions, some dissenting in part, um, the uh, Second Circuit's en banc decision was issued in December of 2023 uh, and reversed the Second Circuit's prior ruling and, uh, and, and, um, and ordered that the case be allowed to proceed. Um, essentially, the en banc court found that the plaintiffs had alleged sufficient injury to establish standing, at least initially, um, and that the case could proceed while the issue of notice uh, to the defendants was litigated. Um, this is something that's going to be interesting and is going to continue to develop. Um, and it's um, 
it's a it's a a highly politicized issue, and I think that in our politically charged environment, uh, we're we're going to see a lot more of this type of litigation. Uh, we are awaiting the issuance of the new Title IX in athletics um, uh, regulations from the Biden administration, uh, which deal with transgender athletes, uh, which I think either way they come out, um, they will spawn a lot more litigation and uh, and certainly a lot more confusion for uh, for school districts and other types of entities that have to um, comply with Title IX. And that's all I have for today. Thank you. That was a lot. And it was really wonderful to learn with you. Thank you for taking the time, Kristen, to come on back. And uh, what you presented on is a great example of the uh, resources that as a firm we have both uh, in higher education and in collegiate athletics specifically. Um, and so really glad you could highlight uh, that kind of uh, issue where really several disciplines uh, really come into play simultaneously. And we would love to have you back on the program when there's more to share um, with regard to the litigation or other developments that you think would be germane to the audience. In the meanwhile, let me uh, then please move on to our next speaker for the afternoon, who's Sam Dobre. And Sam sits uh, nearby me uh, here in New York City. Sam has been on the program a few times previously, um, is uh, focused on uh, labor, and uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Sam on a variety of labor, healthcare crossover type issues. Uh, Sam is here uh, to talk about um, hidden ticket fees that uh, occur within the context of class action complaints. I'll give the floor over to Sam. Really glad that you are with us. And please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction, Gabe. And hello to everyone who has joined us here today. Uh, by way of just a quick introduction, I'm Sam Dobre. I'm an associate in Bonds, New York City office. I handle a lot of class action lawsuits. And today I'm going to talk about a new type of class action lawsuit that has begun to flood the court dockets. Uh, filings began at some point of last year. And I found these lawsuits to be quite interesting because most of us here on this meeting, uh, if the courts certify classes in these cases, are probably going to be included as class members to many of these lawsuits. So here in New York, there has been an uptick in class action lawsuits that seek to contest, quote unquote, hidden ticket fees uh, following online purchases. Now, of course, um, I, uh, everyone here has made online purchases, especially for tickets uh, to attend places of entertainment, such as museums, comedy clubs, movie theaters, I'll list off a few of the defendants in some of these lawsuits already. And these lawsuits are being filed against operators and operators agents of places of entertainment or certain licensees and other ticket resellers. Um, basically any platform that facilitates the, the sale or resale of tickets, um, those are the named defendants in these lawsuits. The class action complaints are being filed in state court and in federal court in New York. All of these actions I'm discussing here today are filed in New York as they're brought pursuant to a New York statute that is called the New York Arts and Cultural Affairs Law. This law governs the ticket sale practices for entertainment providers in New York that sell tickets to certain events. Now, the statute was recently amended in August of 2022, and one law firm here in New York City has been the leader in filing nearly identical class action complaints against various operators of entertainment related to certain charges that customers have for admission to these places of entertainment. According to these lawsuits, these businesses have not adequately disclosed ticketing service fees to customers on their websites. So the statute here, the cultural uh, arts and cultural affairs law statute defines an operator to mean any person who owns, operates, controls a place of entertainment. And then they define a place of entertainment to be anything that is private or publicly owned, operated, such as a theater, stadium, arena, racetrack, museum, amusement park, or other place of performance, concert, exhibits, athletic games, or contests in which they are held and an entry fee is charged. So just a few examples 
um, that everybody can relate to here, uh, companies that have been sued so far are Regal Cinemas, Legoland, AMC Entertainment, Museum of Ice Cream, Wyndham Mountain Club, Gotham Comedy Foundation, Adventureland, Escape the Room. Uh, I myself have purchased tickets to a number of these. Uh, the New York City statute sets out certain requirements. Uh, not New York City, it's a New York law. It sets out requirements for operators and operators agents who are selling these tickets. And the specifics of the law are that disclosure of the ticket cost, inclusive of all its ancillary fees, has to be posted in a clear and conspicuous manner. And the portion of the ticket price stated in dollars that represents a service fee or any other service fee or surcharge has to be included. Uh, the disclosures of these certain charges must be made to, prior to the ticket being selected for purchase. And uh, they quote the statute quotes that subtotals, fees, and charges, and any other component of the total price may not be presented more prominently or in the same or larger size as the total price. Um, the real key piece to these lawsuits is that the price of the ticket shall not increase during the purchase process excluding reasonable fees for delivery of non-electronic tickets. So what these class action complaints repeatedly assert is that these websites are facilitating online ticket sales and prior to the ticket being selected, or I guess where you would check out for purchasing the ticket, um, the ticket price then increases. Uh, next slide, Kathy. So, so what does this mean? These complaints will basically uh, include cookie cutter allegations and they'll only differ based on certain pictures of the website of an operator. So they'll show the first page of a website where a certain price for a ticket will be, let's say $40. And then the customer clicks to, to move on to the next web page, and they may select a seat or other certain specifics. And then there may, may be a final third checkout page that includes a $5 processing fee or electronic fee bring the total cost of $45. These lawsuits are seeking recovery of that $5 fee that was not shown on the first web page in the ticket purchasing process. So plaintiffs in New York State are filing these class action lawsuits against these businesses and also their third-party vendors and websites, alleging non-compliance with the statute, which is Section 2507, failing to disclose service fees up front. The lawsuits, the lawsuits describe these additional fees as deceitful charges that are unfairly imposed on customers and basically that they're disguised under taxes and fees um, and should have been shown up front. What's interesting is that in some of these cases, there are certain electronic fees that are only one or two dollars. So you may ask you know, the name plaintiff here that's bringing the lawsuit may only have one or two dollars in damages. So, so what can these damages include? What can these plaintiffs seek? They're seeking a uh, injunction to stop these practices. And they're also seeking class-wide monetary damages and attorney's fees for every single purchaser since August of 2022. Um, the, the, what the law allows is for actual damages or $50, whichever is greater. But that's if the person's bringing it um, on their own and not as a class. Uh, the, the court may also award reasonable attorney's fees if they were to prevail. Um, ne next slide, Kathy. So just some quick recommendations. As these lawsuits continue to be filed, business should, businesses should stay apprised of new developments. Uh, I, I've seen a number of businesses already take these electronic fees off of their website. Uh, right now, the law and the status of how the courts will, will fall on these complaints is in limbo. Uh, a number of these defendants have filed motions to dismiss for lack of standing and, and basically asserting that the plaintiffs are misreading the statute. The motions to dismiss have been filed in federal court. The briefing schedule in most of these cases that are at the front of the line are set to be out in uh, with the final briefing in May. So we may not get a decision until the later half of this year. So companies should evaluate their ticket sale practices. And if you're working with third-party platforms or ticket resellers, should be diligent in making sure these business partners are in compliance with the law.
And that, that's all I have here today. I'll turn it back to Gabe. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Really interesting. Um, all of us, as you point out, have seen these uh, fees and have you know experienced them. And we'll see whether they become a thing of the past. Uh, it seems like some companies are already making self corrections in anticipation that uh, you know they won't be able to uh, continue on the path they're on. Um, really good information to have under our belts, and so I'm glad that you provided it. Let me now turn to our final speaker for the afternoon, who will be. Uh, Kamisha. Uh, Kamisha Parkins is uh, also in our New York City office. Kamisha uh, has been on the program, as I alluded uh, earlier. Um, this is her third time in the last six weeks, uh, which is pretty remarkable. We are grateful for Kamisha's uh, willingness to present. Um, I should note that Paige Carey, another associate in our New York City office, uh, played a key role in presenting, or rather preparing, excuse me, uh, the remarks that uh, Kamisha will be presenting under my supervision. Um, and it's all about uh, congestion pricing, which is getting closer to reality. Um, it's something that has been discussed here um, literally for years, um, and it never quite got uh, to this point of near implementation. Um, it may end up being a national model, certainly may end up being replicated across New York State, and we thought it was worth your review and more... Uh, you know, thorough understanding by way of Kamisha's comments. So Kamisha, please go right ahead. I look forward to learning along with the group. Thank you in advance. Thank you, Gabe, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining uh, today's webinar presentation. Uh, so a very popular topic as of recently has been uh, the congestion plans here in New York City. Um, and it was recently approved uh, by an 11 to one vote uh, by the MTA on March 27th. So to begin with some background, um, on March 27th, the MTA provided its final approval to the plan for Manhattan. And it, it's extremely significant as Gabe noted, because New York City is on track to become the first city in the country to implement such a plan. The congestion pricing plan, as it's formally uh, called, was derived from the 2019 Traffic Mobility Act. In this act, the New York legislature directed the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority to establish a congestion tolling program for vehicles entering the central business district. Um, most of us would know that as the area south of uh, 60th Street. Uh, and I mean, more specifically, the Tribar Bridge and Tunnel Authority is an affiliate of the um, MTA for those of us who um, aren't uh, familiar with that, uh, with that group. So the MTA collaborated with the Federal Highway Authority uh, to complete an environmental assessment prior to the plan's implementation, which took place from June 2023 to August of 2023. And following that, pursuant to the Traffic Mobility Act, a Traffic Mobility Review Board then issued recommendations for toll prices and potential exemptions for the plan. The, the board uh, was, uh, the, the, well, the board came out of the Traffic Mobility Act. And uh, these, issue, these recommendations were issued in November of 2023. The MTA ultimately had the final say over the congestion plan and uh, thereafter authorized the tolling scheme recommended by the board, uh, as I previously noted, uh, by 11 to one vote on March 27th. Uh, next slide, please, Kat. So the tolling scheme approved by the MTA is as follows. Uh, you can see here on the slide, uh, the different toll prices that have been uh, assigned to each type of vehicle. The full daytime rates will be in effect from 5 a.m. until 9 p.m. each day, uh, each weekday, and um, from 9 a.m. until 9 p.m. on the weekends. Toll rates during the off hours, which are from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m., on weekdays and from 9 p.m. until 9 a.m. on weekends will be about 75% less than these daytime prices. So for example, uh, for the passenger vehicle, the toll will be $3.50 instead of the $15 uh, daytime rate. I do want to make a very important note here about the gridlock alert days. 
Uh, what that means is that the MTA will um, have reserved the right to raise the tolls up to 25% on these gridlock alert days. And what gridlock alert means is um, those are basically days where there are bumper to bumper traffic. Uh, and that's most uh, frequent during the holiday season here in New York City. And um, of course, when the United Nations is in town uh, for the United Nations General Assembly session. Uh, more specifically, there will only be an entry charge uh, included in the congestion pricing plan. So what that means is drivers will only be charged to enter the zone. And that is the central business district, again, the area um, below 60th Street. And um, they will not be charged to leave the zone or stay in it. Again, this means it's only an entry charge. And um, also there will only be one toll uh, levied per day. So what this means is that anyone who enters the area and then uh, let's say they leave and then they return, they will still only be charged uh, that one toll for the day. Next slide, please, Kathy. There are a few exemptions included in this congestion plan. Uh, the, the plan provides for mandatory exemptions and that is pursuant to the Traffic Mobility Act. Uh, those mandatory exemptions include uh, authorized emergency vehicles, uh, as, such as an ambulances, police vehicles, fire vehicles. And uh, another mandatory exemption is vehicles transporting persons with disabilities. There are also planned exemptions. Uh, the planned exemptions include government vehicles, uh, buses providing commuter or transit services, school buses that contract with the New York City Department of Education, and uh, ride shares and taxis. A uh, quick note on the buses uh, exemption, that does include uh, the Hampton Jitney, the Greyhound, Megabus, and the Flip Bus. It's not only uh, the typical MTA buses that are, uh, that are driven uh, around New York City on a daily basis. And on the ride shares and taxis exemption, uh, the taxi uh, the taxis will be subject to a one dollars and twenty five cent surcharge per ride, uh, whereas Ubers and Lyfts and other ride share services they will be subject to a two dollars and fifty cent surcharge per ride. So it um, they have a just a different uh, tolling tolling rate. The plan also provides for discounts. Uh, Low-income drivers who earn less than $50,000 a year, they can apply to pay half the price on the daytime toll, but only after the first 10 trips in a month. Low-income residents of the Central Business District, uh, residents who live in the area of 60th Street and under, who make less than $60,000 a year can apply for a state tax credit. There are also uh, what they call crossing credits, uh, which are for drivers who have already been told on tunnels going into Manhattan. So uh, with these few exemptions, it's also clear, you know, who did not get an exemption. Uh, and that includes uh, public sector employees and uh, those who live in the, the zone where the congestion pricing will be applied, uh, utility companies, uh, those with medical appointments in the area, and also those who drive electric vehicles. Um, these are uh, groups of individuals who will not be uh, included with the exemptions. Next slide, please. So just a, a brief overview of why the program is in place. So the intention of the plan is to uh, generally ease congestion and to generate revenue for the MTA's overall uh, capital plan. So the Traffic Mobility Review Board does cite that the plan is expected to reduce the number of vehicles entering the area by about 17%. And this would amount to about 153,000 fewer cars in that specific portion of Manhattan. Congestion pricing is also designed to collect $1 billion in uh, annual tolls that the MTA claims will contribute to the $15 billion uh, general budget toward infrastructure upgrades 
uh, for the city's subway, buses, and commuter rails. And although um, another purpose that was stated for the program uh, was a, a greenhouse gas emissions, the Federal Highway Administration did declare that congestion pricing uh, would have no actual significant environmental impact. Uh, next slide, please, Kathy. As uh, you probably could expect, uh, there has been a lot of backlash with regard to the congestion plan. Um, there are several lawsuits challenging this plan. Most recently, a group of East Village residents uh, filed a class action lawsuit to stop the plan. And there are also other lawsuits pending. A lot of the criticisms that has been mentioned in these lawsuits have been the lack of sufficient exemptions. And I, I do want to mention that you know, the, the city did include very few exemptions by design. Uh, they, they do want to generate as much revenue from this tune program um, as possible and limit the congestion in the um, area that is um, accounted for in this. And uh, another criticism has been the claim that the program implements an unfair tax against members of the outer boroughs where you know, many communities do not uh, have public transportation options and have no choice but to drive. Another criticism is that congestion pricing will actually divert traffic into other areas, uh, creating pollution elsewhere. And another criticism is that uh, the program will provide New Yorkers, um, well, those opposing the program also cite to the 2021 Green Amendment. Uh, and this Green Amendment, which provides uh, New Yorkers with the constitutional right to clean air, clean water, and a healthful environment. However, uh, there is very little case law with regard to the Green Amendment, so it's difficult to predict how courts will um, associate that with the congestion plan and how they will uh, adjudicate claims about the congestion pricing violating residents' um, environmental rights. So going forward, uh, sorry, next slide, Kathy. Going forward, um, the, the MTA hopes that the congestion pricing will begin in the spring, but it is largely dependent on the resolution of the plenty lawsuits uh, that are currently challenging uh, the plan. Federal judges in New Jersey and New York are expected to hear arguments and uh, rule on the more basic legal questions uh, by approximately mid-June. And uh, at that point, the MTA is aiming to begin the tolling. So um, this is just something that we all should, who live in New York City, of course, should keep an eye on and bonds will uh, definitely keep everyone abreast on, you know, where things are with the congestion plan. Thank you. Misha, thank you very much for providing that update. And as you noted in passing, there's a lot of money riding on this, uh, which uh, relates to the MTA's budget and otherwise, um, you know, businesses, many interests that are converging around this issue. Um, some of which may be represented uh, among audience members here. And so we wanted to make sure that you are aware of where things stand there. And again, there are ripples that uh, may well affect other parts of the state over time. And uh, really, you know, what we're contemplating here in New York City is a potential national model. So um, thank you, Kamisha, for taking the time to bring the group up to speed. And with that, let me move uh, to close our presentation for today. A quick reminder that we have uh, ongoing uh, opportunities for you to take part in our annual labor employment and human resources conferences, which are being held in uh, markets uh, in cities all across New York State. Um, they are being held uh, throughout the months of April, May, and June. Uh, so please register on our website if you are interested. Uh, we get feedback regularly that these are terrific resources for those in the uh, labor and HR spaces. If you have any questions, certainly uh, you can ask any of the bond attorneys uh, you, with whom you regularly work. And um, if you would like to be in touch with any of today's presenters, uh, their email addresses are listed here on 
the slide, these slides will of course be distributed to you uh, and all others uh, who are on our mailing list by tomorrow. And uh, we look forward to continuing to bring you content. We thank you for your responses in uh, both the chat and otherwise in the survey feedback that you provide us. We continue to make this program as best we can, one that really meets your needs. And we thank you both for tuning in and for giving us recommendations. Kristen Smith will be with you um, in a week's time on the 9th, and I expect to be back with you on the 16th. In the meanwhile, wishing you all a very uh, happy afternoon. Be well, and I look forward to seeing you later this month.